Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. We are in the thick of the 2020 Olympic Games. We're bringing you the best coverage with the most storied Olympians to get their insight and in-depth analysis on the races and what they're seeing from a swimmer's perspective. And today we're sitting down with three-time Olympian, 12-time Olympic medalist, Natalie Coughlin. Hi, Coleman. Good to be here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Good. Good. The yeah. dog agrees. <laughs> Great to have you, Natalie. It's it's always awesome seeing you and, and chatting. Um just you've said it you said it before we we got on camera this is your first olympics where you just get to spectate where you just get to sit back and watch what's that been like for you so far yeah first time in 21 years like that's insane um you know it's it's been it's been fun to watch and to be perfectly honest the olympic year like we were speaking before um the recording started about how stressful the olympic games and the olympic year the Olympic year is without the pandemic. And then you have the postponement and then you have the pandemic and like everything, everything surrounding it. I I cannot imagine the stress that these athletes are going through. So I just like empathize with their situations and I am beyond impressed with how well uh, people have been swimming despite the circumstances. Um, I'm, I'm sure this is a question you got a lot, especially competing. Um, but you know, it's a, from a, from a media perspective, I, I get a small taste, um, of, of what an Olympic year, what that lead up is like, um, just because I'm, I'm interviewing the athletes a lot and, and you, you get a sense that there's a heightened energy. There's an intensity that they're approaching training with, but can, can you describe what that Olympic year is like just just because you feel the pressure amping up, um, Mm -hmm. intensity rising. And it's, it's not something that is normal or, or maybe even sustainable for, for, for a long period. Right. It, you you can, you can, you're able to function and grow that way because you know, there's an end date. Yes. And you hit the perfect word, uh, sustainability. Um, it's not sustainable. (laughs) It's not the, the pressure that being Olympian is, or or, or, the year leading up to the games is a lot. And, um, in order to be successful at the Olympic games, you have to tap into something within yourself that is not sustainable. Like (laughs) you have to like, believe that, winning, you have to win gold or, um, you know, your life is over. Like, obviously, you know, logically that your life is not over, but you have to kind of tap into this like life or death. And it's obviously not life or death. Um, but you have to tap into this like internal drive motivation. Um, and it is really, really difficult. And it's, you know, it's something that it's, it's very, very difficult to articulate. Um, but you know, having watched the last six days of the Olympics, that were there, we been on seven days, um, you know, between the swimming and the stories of, of gymnastics and Simone Biles, like it's really forced me to um, kind of reflect on my own experiences. And uh, I am like beyond grateful with the three Olympics I, I went to, and um, they were wonderful experiences, but I mean, the, when you see people break down in tears after their, their, their wins or losses, like it's because they are so raw emotionally and they have given so much of themselves, like physically, mentally, emotionally to that swim that it is draining and it is not sustainable. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm glad you were able to put that into words for us. And, and again, that gives some perspective on that's one Olympic year, right? Like, right. Like and I didn't, too. right. And, and, and not to interrupt you, but I didn't even tap into like the schedule. Like that's just the emotional pressure part of it. Um, <laughs> this schedule of training, you know, training's insane. 
um, because, you know, you're in the water between two to four hours a day, you're lifting weights up to two hours a day, you're trying to get naps in, you're trying to get good uh, night sleep, you're trying to see, you know, physical therapist, um, eat well, uh, you're doing media interviews, you're uh, maybe traveling for sponsor obligations. Um, and then with swimming and, and track is the same way. And, um, you know, a, a lot of other sports are, are this way. When you are chosen as someone who's going to be on the commercials, like the Olympic sponsored commercials, they're choosing this before you made the Olympic team. So just having that pressure on you, it just eats away at you too. You're like, what if I make a fool out of myself and I'm on all these commercials and I don't even make the team. Um, so it like that, the, the schedule is another thing that adds the, the more pressure. That's why it's different than a world championships. It's, it's the same competition, essentially the same schedule. Um, but there is just so much more that goes into an Olympic games. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, and this is all the stuff that we don't, you know, we, as the lay people don't see it goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> We're, we just watch for eight days and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's a little easier to be like, oh, well, why didn't, what, why are they acting like this? Why did they perform like that? And then, and then again, you get that context. Um, and again, just two back-to-back Olympic years, because we didn't realize, you know, the, the pandemic started in March and they didn't postpone the Olympics until April of t- 2020. So everyone had already geared up. Everyone <laughs> already had that Olympic year. And then mm-hmm. to kind of have, have, have a reset, but then have to do it all over again. Um, yeah, you, I think, I think you see some of those sustainability issues come out at the Olympic trials and, and at the Olympic games with some of those athletes who've just, who, who, who know what that pressure is like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it, I, again, like I haven't watched the Olympic games in 21 years, so I, I maybe it, there was this in the previous games, but, um, just the raw emotion, um, that you see like Caleb Dressel, like breaking down in tears after his, um, his first goal, individual gold was like so heartwarming. And I could, I could relate to that so much. Like, I'm sure he's not someone who cries often, but it, it, (laughs) it, it's just so many years of blood, sweat, and tears go into that one moment. And, it's something that defines you um, for better or worse. It defines you that those races. And um, so I think, you know, as a Olympic fan, we get to see the good side of that, but then you also see the bad side of that too. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you've been able to watch, D- did you watch in 2000? I didn't, I was like still bitter <laughs> about, uh, about not making the team in 2000. I, I might've watched like a couple nights, but I had just gotten to college. So, um, I like, it was my freshman year at Cal. Um, so I think I watched a little bit, but the, the wound was still pretty raw. <laughs> so you, you were, I think you were a pretty heavy favorite to make the team in 2000 and I should have made the team. Um, I, I mean, I had a big injury in 99. Like I was, I was, you know, national champion in 98 and, um, on the hand pack team in 99. And, um, yeah, like my trajectory was going upward and then I had tore my labrum and then everything like imploded, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. But yeah, the wound is still very raw. So I didn't really watch 2000. Makes sense. And also I feel like, um, you know, 21 years later in our day and age of social media and screens everywhere, I don't think you can't not watch the Olympics now. Oh, I know. Again, like we, we were talking, I, so my kids go to bed at 730 and here in the West coast, the coverage starts at 630. So I'm trying to watch it on tape delay and I get spoilers no matter what, like, even if I stay off of social media, I go on the NBC app and I'm trying to go to specific races and the thumbnails tell me who wins. Like I was so upset the other night, I was trying to watch it and pretend like I was watching it live. And I saw Lydia won the hundred breaststroke because the thumbnail told me it was that she won. I was so upset. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that is unfortunate, but I, I'm, I'm happy to hear you get to watch this time around. 
So, uh, you know, obviously as an athlete, you've been there before. What, what have you seen that stood out to you, especially maybe in some of those events that you competed in hundred back hundred free 200 IM? Um, what stood out to me is, um, kind of the surprise winners, um, like, like Bobby Fink, like what the hell was that last 50? <laughs> like, I, I, re, I mean, I'm sure most people did. Thank God for DVRs. But like, I rewound that, like, just to rewatch that last hundred. I was just like, what was that? And then I couldn't even tell if he was happy or surprised or, or what. I think like he was trying to process it in real time. Like watching that was so great. Watching Lydia surprise herself watching, um, I don't want to, um, mess up her name, but the 200 breaststroker from last night, watch, watch them surprise themselves. Like that has been so amazing. The men's foreign and free, um, there have been so many surprise winners, I think. Um, and that's been something that I can't, I don't remember that in, in 16 as much. And I definitely don't remember that in 12, eight or four, um, Mm -hmm. So I think there's just been a lot of surprise winners, like people like just dark horses who come out of nowhere and you're like, that is incredible. And, and watching the emotion watch, wash over their face in real time as they look and see that number one, it is like so cool. That is really cool. And again, I'm going to go back to this, this double Olympic year theory. This is my theory is, is that a lot of those, you know, surprise winners, um, are young and first time mm-hmm. Olympians. So they, mm-hmm. they don't really, they're still a little starry eyed and they, they've never been to an Olympics before. They don't know what to expect. So it's all new to them. They didn't have yeah. pressure going in, uh, of, of, to the end of their second Olympic year of, okay, I really have to batten down the hatches and I have to deal with this pressure. They're just like, I just want to make it. I just, I just want to go. No, totally. That being a rookie is the best blessing because it, there's no downside. You know, if, if you don't win a medal, like the expectations aren't placed upon you. So it's like, you got to be an Olympian. Like, that's great. But if you go in as the defending gold medalist, or if you go in as a heavy favorite, it is exponentially harder. So I totally agree with you. I think there is something to that. So I have, I have to ask you about the women's hunter backstroke, uh, Kayla McEwen world record holder went in as the heavy favorite. And then, and then we had Reagan Smith who, who had the world record, uh, just, just before Kaylee broke it in May, I want to say May or June. Um, what, what did you make of this race and, and what did you see from a, from a, just a stroke perspective or a race strategy perspective? Oh, specifically, that was one of the races, sadly, that was spoiled for me. So I didn't watch it as closely and as um, with like the same type of eye that I would had I watched it live. Um, But just that was such a stacked race, like from top to bottom. Um, And once again, I was just glad that I got, got to be a spectator and not wasn't competing myself. Um, but, uh, yeah, unfortunately that was one of the many races that have been spoiled. So, um, I can't speak to the analysis in depth as much as I would like. (laughs) Fair enough. Uh, I want to go, so let's, let's go back to, but all that being said, Reagan was amazing and like, it has continued to be amazing. And like, I'm, I haven't, I don't think if we've met, I, I don't remember if we've met, I don't, um, yet but um she's been really really fun to watch and uh i'm excited for her future because i think it's the ceiling is very very high agreed especially seeing that the 200 fly that she put together uh, in a lot of her races in that event we had seen her go out pretty quickly and then not be able to bring it home as quick we'd seen Haley pass her pretty much every time they, they went head to head and then they go head to head in the final and kind of the opposite happened where Haley was out quickly and, and Reagan actually swam a little more of a controlled race and was able to bring it home that last 50 and, and get a silver, which was, which, which is really cool to see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so let's go back to your Olympic experience in 2004, your rookie Olympics. Tell me about, tell me about the freshness of that for you. Um, just, just again, missing the team in 2000 and then getting to, to make it and swim 
a pretty packed schedule in Athens. Yeah. So I, um, I, what, yeah, so I was a rookie and, but I, I was still like the heav- heavy favorite going into the hundred back, um, being the world record holder. Um, so I didn't have really that benefit of being a true rookie where no one was looking at. Um, but I mean, I'm not going to cry over it. It was a great, um, it was a privilege, but just, just saying that. Um, yeah. So it going into 2004, um, I really looked at the schedule and I wanted to be great in all of my events. I didn't want to be mediocre in, um, in anything. So at the time, my hundred fly was very, very strong. I, uh, but I chose not to race in that. And my 200 free was very, very strong, but I chose not to race in that individually because I wanted to be great on the relays and I wanted to be great, um, in the hundred back and hundred free. So, um, so that's how I ended up with the three relays and then the hundred back and, and hundred free. Um, and then from there, it was just, so overwhelming. Like you have, I, I had been to Pan Pacific games before and I've been to world championships before, but when you're six years old and you decide you're going to be an Olympian someday, and then 15 years later, you're there. Um, it's hard to be really present in the moment. Um, you're kind of just taking it all in. Like, again, you know, logically that it's the same competition that you've done before. Uh, there's prelim semifinals, finals, it's more or less the same, uh, schedule and competitors, but it's just heightened. And, um, I just remember after my gold in hundred back, that was, I think day, yeah, day three, there's just like such a relief, like a sense of relief. Like you don't have that weight on you, or at least I didn't have that weight on me anymore. And I could just compete and have fun. And then we had the four by two, 800 free relay where we broke the last East German world record, which was amazing. Um, and that was so fun. And then, yeah, I was able to get a bronze in the hundred free. Like it was everything just kind of, there was a lot of momentum once, once I got that individual gold. And I remember, I remember hearing Rowdy like in, um, you know, interview or not interviews, but in, in, on the broadcast being like, yeah, she has these world, all these world records and national titles and NC2A champion, but she doesn't have that individual gold. And I just remember hearing that like in my head, <laughs> no offense, Rowdy, like that's, that's your job. Uh, but I just remember like that, that pressure I was like, I felt such a sense of relief once I had that. You talked about having that momentum and getting the ball rolling. I feel like that's really what we saw with Caleb in that hundred free. He got his first individual gold. There, there had been this, such, such weight on his shoulders from the previous world championships, not getting that individual gold. And then, like you said, to see all that emotion come out and, and just to kind of see him get achieve that. And now it's like, he can't really be touched. Like Hunter. Right. Fly. Like icing on the cake, <laughs> you know, he's going to be ridiculous tonight. Like he's it's like, I have no doubt in my mind. And I totally agree. I, I think, I think the, the, the train left the station and it can't really be stopped at this point. So then heading into your second Olympics, 2008, again, you're the heavy favorite. This time you're the defending champion. Can you describe the, the, the difference in pressure and the difference of those heightened senses coming into those games? Oh, man. It, it, like, I, yes, the, the, there was um, so much more pressure. <laughs> and thank God the Hunter back was always my first individual race because um, I, and I did it successfully in 0- 04 and 08. Um, once I won gold, I again, felt such a sense of relief and like catharsis of, um, and you saw that, like, I, I have never been someone who's been super emotional and I cried hysterically. <laughs> on, like once I saw Terry after my race, after my final race, she was crying and I started crying and then I got myself together for, um, the award ceremony. And then I saw Margaret Holtzer tear up. And then I was like 
sobbing, like ugly crying, like snot and red face and so embarrassing. But um, that <laughs> it was just such a sense of the catharsis of like, oh, thank God. Now I just get to enjoy the rest of the Olympic games and it's all icing on the cake. Like the fact that I got a bronze medal in the 200 I am, I had no business being in that race. I had no idea what, what I was doing. And I just didn't feel any pressure um, anymore. And um, yeah, and then the 100 free and then the other relays. So yeah, I could see that and I and I could empathize with it with the other swimmers and Caleb and I and I'm not comparing myself to him in any way, shape or form. And he has way more pressure than I ever had in 04, 08 um, or 12. But um, I have a glimpse of what uh, they're going through. Yeah, and, and, and I appreciate you sharing that glimpse with us because I, th I think as lay people, as non-athletes, we have less of that glimpse. Um, I, it, so moving into the rest of the meet, it's only two more finals. Um, is there anything particular you're looking forward to seeing? I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the mixed relays. Um, I... I I never got to compete in any of those. Like, I think I, I did uh, short course worlds one, uh, when it was in Doha, I got to compete on a couple of those, but um, never long course. And I was always jealous. I thought that would be so fun as an athlete to compete. Like I would have, you know, and if it was an 04 or 08, like being on a relay with Michael Phelps would have been amazing, but I never got to experience that. Um, so that, that will be fun as an Olympic fan. Uh, I'm really excited to see Katie Ledecky's 800. Um, really, really excited to see uh, the 50 freeze. I think those are gonna be so fast, like so fast. Um, and what, what events are left? Uh, it, it's kind of crazy. It comes down to the wire. Like you're like, wait, we've gone through so many events. Yeah, those, those are the ones that I'm really, really excited about. Yeah, yeah. Well, N Natalie, it's, it's always great talking to you and catching up with you. Thank you for sharing your Olympic perspective. We appreciate it. Uh, any parting thoughts before we sign off today? No parting thoughts. Uh, it, it's just been, it's been a really weird year. Uh, yes, I do have these. I do have parting thoughts. <laughs> I lied. Um, yeah, and, and this is just the greater Olympics. Um, I, uh, you get a lot of arm, armchair quarterbacking and that's part of, part of this. And that's why the Olympics are so big is people have such invested um, feelings and attitudes towards it. Um, I, yeah, it, there's a lot going on with, the, with these athletes and just to realize that they are human, they have feelings, and um, they're under a lot of pressure. So to kind of give them some grace when they stumble, I think is, is really, really important. And that, that's not not just for the swimmers, that's for all the athletes. Um, they have dreamt about being in this position for years and years and years and years. And um, it's hard, like it's really, really hard. So um, I think they do a great job of putting everything on the line and we get to see that. And that's why we see so many emotions um, and especially more this time around. Yeah. I, I have to, I have to mention this. I, I just talked to your former DC Trident teammate, Cody Miller. And he, he, I, I was like, any parting thoughts, Cody he said the exact same thing. <laughs> no, but yes. <laughs> No, he, he, he was like, listen, uh, for all the fans at home, like be, be nice <laughs> because these athletes, like no, no athlete gets to the Olympics and then gives 80%, right? Yeah. right? It's like, yeah. they give their all they, they, they try as they're, they're doing their best with where they're at in those eight days, which could, which right. I'm sure is, is an enormous spectrum of, they could be in the best place possible could be in a, in a really bad place, but, but they're doing their best with what they've got. Right. And they're, they're human and they have human emotions. And so, 
you, you, you start to think of someone as like a brand or like a superhero or a commodity and you forget that, hey, maybe this, these crappy comments will get back to them. And how would that feel when it's coming at you from all these you know, anonymous sources and you have millions of followers on Twitter or Instagram or whatever? Um, it's hard. Even if you logically know it doesn't matter, it still eats at you. And so, yeah, just be nice. <laughs> the golden rule, treat others how you would like to be treated. <laughs> the golden rule uh, from the golden girl, Natalie. <laughs> Again, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Natalie. Thanks, Coleman. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.